show. I'm glad you're here. Hope you had a good afternoon. Uh, I was just sitting at home uh, reading and watching TV and get a text. Uh, where are you? Uh, well, I'm at home. Where, where else do you think I am? Reminding me of Deacon's meeting that I had totally forgotten about. Uh, and, you know, I don't, last time they had a Deacon's meeting without me, I pulled up and my name wasn't listed on the church sign, <laughs> so I, I had to be there. Of course, the church sign was just a blackboard anyway, and they wrote it in chalk, and Chairman Deacons would stand there and, uh, you know, toss the eraser up and down the whole time I preached. But we had a real good time. I, I love our deacons. They are servants. They have the church's best interests in, in mind. There's none of this you know, board of deacons. I don't like that term. They're not the administrators. They're the servants. Uh, I think the best churches are deacon served, committee administered, pastor led, congregationally approved. Uh, I just think that's, that has served us well over the years, and we continue that uh, here at Public Court. Uh, again, thank you, Steve, for what you did this morning. I thought it was great. Uh, would y'all like to have him again tonight? Amen. Okay, now let's uh, yeah. You want to come on? Uh, 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 no, not, not now. <laughs> uh, not now. Uh, not now. Uh, not now. Uh, just stand there and stretch for a while. If you haven't picked up the offering envelopes, they're right out here. Uh, baby bottles, remember, two weeks from today, uh, we'll pass those out. And, and try to keep up with that in return because uh, I kind of got scolded. We had three bottles that weren't returned last year. So uh, oh, that's pretty good out of 100 bottles, three weren't returned. They really keep up with that. So just fill it, bring it back, and we'll take it over to, to Brownsville Baptist. Again, uh, let me make one final appeal for our trip. If you or anyone you know is interested, be sure and let me know. We're kind of on that dividing line, do we or do we not? So I, I need to know in the next uh, week or so. So please uh, communicate that with me. Anything else that needs to be mentioned? Any specific prayer concerns? I, I know uh, Miss Betty was telling me uh, this morning uh, about the, the Hines Lee's her sister and brother, or uh, Mr. Silas' sister and brother-in-law. Uh, uh, she's home, but he's still there uh, in the hospital. So you'll be praying for the Hines Lee's. Anybody else? Yeah, Dad. We want to remember Butch Porch. He had open heart surgery Thursday. Butch Porch. Where do I know him from? Relief team. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, yeah, I know that's him. Relief team. Yeah. We all are together. Oh, I, I think the world of that guy. Uh -huh. So he had, I think the world of that guy. Yeah. So he uh, had bypass surgery then. I really don't know. I just know he had open heart surgery. Okay. Last well, I've heard he was good. Good. Okay. I appreciate that, man. I was not aware of that. Anybody else? Yeah, Bob. We got a neighbor, Sam Bank, who's in a bad accident. And uh, he's down in the med right now. He's broken up parts of his body. He's a young, young child. Uh, he's a student at uh, UT at Knoxville, but he's home in the Christmas time. Sam Bank. He's a real bad wreck. He's lucky to be alive. Well, absolutely. God spared his life for a reason. They said did some reconstructive surgery on his face and he's got knee problems, leg problems, broken They said they had to use double um, double bone jaws to do double bone. Mm -hmm. So well, thank, thank God he spared his life for a reason. What about to answer prayers? Anybody got a praise they want to share? Don't, don't leave, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Anybody got an answer to prayer? Or a praise? Praise God for a new year? <laughs> praise God for an awesome church and a good crowd this morning? I don't. I didn't get a count, but we had a nice crowd today. I thought I was real, real pleased. Good service. It, you know, it's not the way I like to do the Lord's Supper, but this is just kind of a temporary uh, reality. Hopefully by April, when we do it again, we'll be back to normal. All right, let's pray and see the pulpit is yours. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful day of worship. We thank you for your presence. We feel you tonight. 
We know, Lord, we're on holy ground. And we're going to receive a message from you. I pray tonight that we will just leave here on cloud nine because we serve such a spectacular Savior. A Savior who's good and kind and strong and brave and, and servant-hearted. And I pray that we, would, we who carry his name would do so in a way that uh, befits the royal blood that flows through our veins. Help us never to do anything that might give Jesus a black eye or might cause people to question <coughs> our church or our sincerity. We know that people uh, are watching us. People know who we are. They know we're believers, or at least I hope they do. And I pray that we would never, ever, ever do anything that might cause them to question the reality of our salvation. Help us to be morally pure. Help us to be uh, uh, upright. Help us, Heavenly Father, just to carry the glow of the gospel everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, by the way, I forgot the uh, these meeting too. <laughs> oh, we talked about it. Yeah, my wife, uh, Susan came and said, you going to get up? I was taking me a little nap. She, I said, what time is She said, 5 o'clock. I said, no, nah, I ain't got nothing going on. I'll get up in another 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, well. Stand with me and let's sing. He keeps me singing. Page 425. <laughs>
Jesus. So, uh, you know, if you've got King James, uh, bring that. 
If you've got a smartphone or a tablet, uh, that is the translation that I'll be using. Uh, 1 John 1, beginning to read in verse 1. Uh, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, uh, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd open our eyes tonight. Help us to see what you intend for us to see. I pray that your spirit would illuminate us, that every word that I speak would just be magnified and multiplied a thousand times over. I pray that people would not hear a human voice tonight. May they hear the voice of the Spirit of God as he provides insight and encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Every one of you my age or older remembers exactly where you were and what you were doing on July 20th, 1969. Anybody remember what you were doing? Sheila wasn't even born then, so that, that, doesn't, that doesn't include you. That was the night that Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon. We went out to my aunt and uncle's house because they had a color TV. And, and I remember making the stupid comment. I said, I think I'm just going to sit out in the front yard and watch it rather than watch it on TV. I thought, you know, I could see the moon from the front yard. But I mean, it was a monumental worldwide experience. We've been planning. We've been spending. It was our chance to really stick it to the Russians. We were the first people on the moon, and they dropped a plaque there that, that still exists to this day, saying that uh, you know we arrived on June 20th, 1969. Over 4 billion people worldwide watched it, and everybody rejoiced. It was an opportunity for us to come together as a country. <laughs> you know, the 60s were a lot of fun. We had assassinations, we had the Vietnam War, we had uh, you know, presidencies rise and fall and rise and fall. It was a difficult decade, but this was icing on the cake, and people were so excited to just visually look and see man walking on the moon. Well, two years after that, this little-known author named Ron Gallert wrote a fictional book. He, he was just kidding. He was just trying to entertain people, but he wrote a book entitled Capricorn One. They made a movie out of it as well. And in this book, he just kind of wrote this theory that there were people in Congress who really wanted to defund NASA. Vietnam was costing, costing us you know, $10 million a day, and there were people who said, let's not waste that money on NASA, let's put it in Vietnam and win this war and get out of there. And that was what the book was all about. People in Congress wanted to shut down NASA. Well, the administrators in NASA said, we better do something. We better do something big and dramatic or we're going to lose our funding. So they rented this uh, sound stage in Nevada and they staged a fake moon landing. You had all the grainy camera images. They had this fake a spaceship land. They had a fake astronaut step out and walk around. And that was the thesis of the book. He, he just thought, you know, I'm going to have a good time and just write this alternative history. Well, I want you to know that book caught fire. It became the bestseller for the year 1970. Millions of people read that book, and within a couple of years, one-fourth of all Americans doubted that we had actually stepped on the moon. One-fourth bought into this theory that it was a big fraud perpetrated in a soundstage somewhere. Now you say, that's ridiculous. We saw it with our very own eyes. How could we two years later have turned our back on that? You know, the same thing happened after uh, September 11th. There were people who said this was a, a, a monumental 
uh, uh, strategy perpetrated upon the American people. It was this grand scheme. George W. Bush wanted to go to war in the Middle East, and we needed a pretext, so we just created this tragedy, and that gave us the impetus to go over there and just carpet bomb the entire country. And you had people who actually believed that. We watched with our very eyes these towers falling, people jumping because they had no other uh, option. Uh, and there were people who said, that, that was just a big fake. That was a fraud. The government did that themselves as a pretext to, to go to war. You think, how ridiculous. People see these things, and they believe it at the time, but then later on, they start buying into all of these conspiracy theories, and the next thing you know, you've got a bunch of doubters and deniers. Well, you know, the author of Ecclesiastes said there's nothing new under the sun. It may surprise you to know that the same thing happened re regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a historical figure. Make no, make no mistake about that. I mean, we know factually that Jesus lived. We've got eyewitness accounts. Tens of thousands of people saw him and swore to his identity. You can't say Jesus did not exist. Virtually everybody in Palestine either saw him or heard him or knew something about it. It was an absolutely undeniable fact that people had heard him and seen him. And now, 50 years later, people started to say, well, you know, I'm not real sure what I saw. I saw a nice fellow walking around, and he did some good things, and he spoke inspiring words, but, but really, what did I see? Did I see the real Savior, or did I see some fraud? Did I see some religious fanatic? And, and all these weird conspiracy theories started to circulate in the church at Ephesus. John here, the writer, is pastor of the church at Ephesus, established by the Apostle Paul. It was the largest and strongest church in Christendom, hundreds of members, and they had a real foothold in Ephesus. You know, Jesus wrote a word to them in Revelation 2. He said, you've done all this, you're doctrinally straight, you've got a sweet fellowship, but one thing I have against you, you've left your first love. That is the church that John is pastoring. And in the midst of that fellowship, you had about three different conspiracy theories, and here he was trying to juggle all of that and preach the word and win people to Jesus Christ. There was one group who called themselves the Docetics, D-O-C-E-T-I-C-S. These were people who said, Jesus really did not have a human body. Jesus was some sort of a ghost. Jesus never had a headache. He never got hungry. He never got hot. He never got cold. He was just some sort of a phantom who never left a footprint anywhere. He looked exactly like a human being, but he wasn't. He was a spirit, a ghost sent from God. And you had people who actually believed that bunk. Then you had another group called the Corinthians, not the Corinthians, but the Corinthians. They said uh, Jesus' divinity was limited to a short period of time. They said Jesus became divine at the moment he was baptized, and a dove came and lit on his shoulder. And he was divine for the next several years. And as Jesus was walking up the hill to Gol Golgotha, his divinity left him. So he was born a mere mortal, he was raised a mere mortal, and he died a mere mortal with the exception of a three-year period where he was divine. And the logic behind this was, you know, God doesn't die. No way to kill God. How could God have breathed his last on a cross? And there were a lot of people who bought into that. Then there was a group called the Gnostics. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. -S. And these were the people who said, now, now, trusting Jesus for salvation is just not enough. There is some special knowledge that you've got to have. And we and we alone have that special knowledge. And we will impart that to you. 
You know, that, that's how cults operate. They say, well, you've got the Bible, but the Bible is just not enough. You need the Book of Mormon. You need the Pearl of Great Price. You need doctrines and covenants and all of these other documents approved by the Mormon church. And they say, you know, the Bible is all uh, good and well, and Jesus was a great guy, and we acknowledge him, but we've just got some extra knowledge that you need to have. And if you will buy into this extra knowledge, when you die, you'll become a god. You'll have your own universe. You and your spouse will rule forever. And you just uh, you know, buy these books and, uh, and you'll receive that special insight. I don't know how. Maybe one of y'all did it to me as a joke. I don't know. But I bet I get 10 emails a day from the official Church of Mormon, Church of God of Latter-day Saints. Ten, at least 10 a day. And they've even got these Mormon uh, travel tours. That you can go and visit all of the spots where Joseph Smith supposedly received the, the, the book that he published. Uh, and I keep, you know, saying, please take me off of your list, but, you know, that, that's impossible. That's kind of like our junk mail here. We, you know, we still get mail for Eddie Maloney from 15 years ago. I'm not talking about the last year's Eddie Maloney. I'm talking 15 years ago Eddie Maloney. We, we still get his mail. So you have all of these different groups trying to coincide within the church. You know, what if we had uh, that kind of divided fellowship here? We had a little section that believed one thing. We had another section who believed something different. We had a third section who sat back there and huddled and, and critiqued everything the preacher said. Uh, that would ensure that we would be stuck in neutral for all of time and eternity. Churches are only effective if they are unified, if they are doctrinally sound, if they are on the same page theologically, if they understand their mission, they know why Jesus put them there, I mean, with attitudes and understandings like that, the sky is the limit. But uh, we've got to make sure we get a uh, number one right. The basic uh, essentials of, of salvation are what we believe about Jesus Christ. If we get that wrong, everything else will be wrong. So that's why John writes this letter and just tries to reintroduce people to Jesus. One of my preaching professors in England said that every time you preach, you ought to assume that your congregation has no idea what you're talking about. Now, I'm not going to do that with y'all. Uh, you know, a lot of y'all have walked with God for years and you're students of the Word. I'm not going to assume that you're totally ignorant about Jesus Christ, but I do want to use this as an opportunity to reintroduce Him to us and just make sure that we have everything lined up for the year to come. John is in a unique position to assess Jesus Christ. He was Jesus' first cousin. You know, his mother Salome was a sister to Mary, so they were cousins. And when John took in his Aunt Mary, he was just doing what uh, custom dictated. If somebody died, a family member would take in the next of kin. That's why John took her in. Uh, John was referred to as the beloved disciple. He was one of a small subgroup of disciples along with James and Peter who had a special, unique relationship with Jesus. He was the only disciple at the cross. Uh, he was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Uh, he was able to witness future events. He was banished to an island called Patmos. And while he was out there, Jesus appeared to him and revealed the things that are to come. And like I said, we had that recorded in the book of Revelation. So I, I would suggest and submit, he's probably the best person in early Christendom to write this book and describe Jesus Christ for us. Had a unique insight and relationship that gave him a special ability to describe who Jesus Christ was. So he introduces us uh, and describes Jesus in three terms in this letter. You know, letter writing is, is a lost art. Nobody ever writes letters anymore. I jokingly told Jane when I came, uh, I only want first class mail. If I get some mail that's not first class, I don't want it. 
well, if, you know, if I restricted it like that, I'd never get any mail. <laughs> That's all I get is occupant or resident. Letter writing is just a lost art. I don't know the last time I have written a, a letter. I might drop a note in the mail. But, but I'm not a letter writer. I love to get letters. I think that's a, a real treat. But it's just a lost art. But in those days, you know, this is how people communicate. This was called a circular letter. John wrote it and just gave it to people in the church. They read it. They passed it along. They passed it along. And before you know it, the entire church, and maybe even beyond that, had read this letter. What does he say about Jesus? First of all, he says Jesus is the eternal Christ. The eternal Christ. First part of verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard and seen, etc. Jesus Christ has existed from the beginning. The dawn of time. This is the very same language that Genesis 1.1 uses. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, that's what the, the point that John is pressing here. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second member of the Godhead, the second member of the Trinity, uh, was there at the dawn of time. He has always existed. There has never been a time when He did not exist. There are some Bible scholars, and I don't necessarily think they're wrong, there are some Bible scholars who believe that 1 John is a sermon uh, you know, the whole five chapters is a sermon based on what John wrote in John's Gospel, chapter 1. Uh, John makes these statements, and then 1 John is a sermon that elaborates on that. Remember what John 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehendeth it, it not. Uh, overcomes it not is another way to translate that. So John picks up on that theme and emphasizes to his readers and to us that Jesus Christ is eternal. He always has been and he always will be. That, that is almost impossible for us to grasp. We live in a society that, that treasures time. Uh, every one of us is wearing a watch. You've got, to, on your smartphone, you've got the time. You've probably got two or three clocks at home. We really operate by the clock. That's not, you know, how it used to be. People really just didn't appreciate time. If they understood what John said, or what John meant, when he said Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ was present when the earth was created, when man fell, when the flood covered the earth, as the people of God were slaves in Egypt, when God raised up a liberator named Moses, when the people struck out on their own in the wilderness, when the people conquered Canaan, when the nation was established, when the nations rose and fell and rose and fell. Jesus Christ has always been there and always will be. Jesus Christ was there during World War I. Jesus Christ was there during the Holocaust. Jesus Christ was there on September 11th. Jesus Christ is here in the midst of 350,000 COVID deaths, or, uh, or so the claim is made. Jesus Christ is described as the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who thought it up, and he's the one who will bring it to a conclusion. Did you know it is entirely proper to say, to make these three statements, I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. All three of those are appropriate. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were justified. Your sin was covered, and you were sure a home in heaven. But as you grow in Christ, you're becoming a disciple, you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and one day off in the future, you'll stand before the throne of God, you'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and you'll hear those words, or hopefully you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Remember the verse that says, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation 
of the earth. So we have the eternal Christ. He also describes for us the incarnate Christ. Incarnate. That is a Christmas word that uh, preachers like to use in, in Bataran. It, it's not a difficult word. It simply refers to the fact that God took on human form. God robed himself in human flesh, came to live among us that he might be able to identify with us and say to people, I know what you've been through. I know your temptations. And I want you to know there is always an escape route that I'm going to provide. That I, I, one of my commentaries this so week that I read, I thought made a fascinating statement. He said the incarnation is God's attempt to describe himself to his children. People for centuries wondered, what is God like? God came to the earth and he was kind and gracious and loving and, and accepting and, and forgiving. That is how God the Father is. And it, it says there in verse 2, his life for the life was manifested and we have seen it. Every one of his readers had seen Jesus Christ. There was no doubt about it at all. And John was reminding them, you know, he wasn't some spook who never left a footprint. He wasn't a partial savior. He wasn't somebody who revealed the, the truth to people and you had to kind of hit on the right combination. He was the embodiment of Almighty God. He was the spitting image, if you'll excuse that term. He was the spitting image of God the Father. I love the story about this wealthy Belgian teenager named Joseph de Wuster. He was born into the wealthiest family in the country of Belgium. As a child, he uh, had every luxury you can imagine. It was uh, expected that he would go into college and take over the family business and, and would become even wealthier. But at the age of 18, he announced to his family, his community, God had called him to be a priest. And he was going to give all of that up and enter the priesthood. And that's what he did. He trained for several years and finally it came time for him to be appointed. Uh, he said, I want you to send me to the most dangerous and difficult place on the face of the earth. So they did. They sent him to the Hawaiian island of Molokai. Molokai is about the only thing on the island is a leper colony. That's where they would send lepers to die. And they assigned Joseph de Wuster, who was now named Father Damien, they sent Father Damien to Molokai. He got there and was a colossal flock. You know, he couldn't identify with those people. These were people who had the most horrific disease known to man. And here he was, a healthy, wealthy, white European, and, and he couldn't relate. He didn't know what they were going through. They just rejected him, would not listen to a word he had to say. Well, he wrote his superiors. He said, I, I've just got to quit. I cannot continue my service here. So they sent a boat. He went down to the dock to catch the boat, had all of his possessions in a little uh, suitcase that he kept with him, as he was sitting there waiting on the boat, he looked down and saw a little piece of, of white on his arm. A little piece of dead flesh. It started itching. He took his shoes off and noticed that his toes had turned sort of whitish. He hadn't even noticed in his desire to get out of there. Well, to make a long story short, he discovered that he himself had leprosy. And by the time, and obviously he couldn't leave. Nobody would take him. So by the time he got back to his little hut, word had spread in the community. And virtually every leper on the entire island was in his front yard. And they embraced and they sang together. And they trusted Christ as their Savior. And he had a tremendous ministry there because he became one of them. Jesus became one of us. And, and John backs it up. He says in verse 1, we have heard him. We've heard his voice. John heard the parables. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He heard those seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. He said, we have seen him. That's a word that means a quick glance. 
And then he says in the next statement, we have looked upon him. That is a word that talks about a gaze and intent stare. You know, we have glanced at him, we've stared at him, we've heard him, we have touched him. You know, a woman who had a blood flow issue touched him and was immediately healed. He would touch lepers and they would immediately be healed. Uh, doubting Thomas put his finger in Jesus' wounds and immediately believed. So John says, uh, there's no secret about Jesus. Uh, what you know of him is what you have seen. He is eternal and he is incarnate. And in, in verse 2, John uses some unique phrases to try to explain what's happened. He, he says uh, Jesus uh, was manifested. To manifest is a word that means to bring to light something that was hidden. You know, for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, no word from God at all. You had a, several generations who were born and raised in total silence, no divine decree at all. But Jesus came along and he brought to light something that people had long considered a, a mystery. God incarnate means that we have a Savior who sympathizes with our failures and our temptations and our emotions, etc. Everything you are experiencing, Jesus has experienced and Jesus is experiencing right now. Hebrews says we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with our humanity. We have a high priest who understands who we are and what makes us tick. So John reintroduces Jesus. He describes the eternal Christ. He describes the incarnate Christ. But finally, he describes the available Christ. Look at verse 3. That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. John said, yeah, you can have fellowship with, with me, but beyond that, and more than that, you can have fellowship with God the Father. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, there's the availability of intimacy with God. We have been enabled to know each other and to encourage each other. The word fellowship is a Greek word, koinonia. It comes from the word common. There was a common goal. There was common royal blood that flowed through the people's veins. There was a, a common understanding of their purpose. Everything was just sort of pooled and common. I'm not talking about some ancient socialism. I'm just talking about an ancient church where people really looked after each other and there were no needs at all because people were sensitive to the needs that existed. When we were in San Antonio this week, we walked by one of my favorite restaurants, have any of y'all ever eaten at a Hard Rock Cafe? I mean, now don't tell me I'm the only one. Yeah, sure. You know, we have eaten at Hard Rock Cafes all over the world. If you're in Paris and, and you know, snails are just not appetizing to you, you can always go to Hard Rock Cafe and get a hamburger. <laughs> Hard Rock Cafe was started by a man from Jackson, Tennessee, a man by the name of Isaac Tigre. And there are 300 restaurants literally all over the world. And, and we've eaten it. And a lot of them, the food is always pretty good. As we walked by there the other day, I, I saw something I had forgotten. There was a big banner there with the restaurant's motto. Anytime you go into a Hard Rock Cafe, this motto will be emblazoned everywhere you look. All of the servers have a button that says this. Some of you know where I'm heading with this. Their motto is love all, serve all. Now, you know, Hard Rock Cafe, I'm, I'm positive, is not a Christian organization, but they get it right when it comes to their mission. That is our mission. You know, we, we ought to have a big sign out front saying love all, serve all. We are here to love our community. We are here to serve our community. I haven't really given you an, an update, but you know, several weeks ago, we had a, a, a young lady who had four sons who had a real need for Christmas. And we took up a, a very generous offering, and we were able to go and, and help her purchase uh, clothing and things for her kids for Christmas. We, we bought her a ham. 
We bought her uh, some chicken, you know, just some basic necessities. And you are so generous in doing that. And, and I know you do it every Sunday if you knew the needs that existed. So let's let that be our motto. We'll just call ourselves the Brownsville version of the Hard Rock Cafe. And we are here to love all and serve all. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my heroes. Uh, he was a German pastor. And he was about the only one who dared speak out and stand up against Adolf Hitler. Most other pastors embraced Hitler. They would preach in the Nazi brown shirt uniform. They would start the service with the Nazi salute. They would have swastikas everywhere. They really believed in Adolf Hitler's theology and his mission to become the dominant country in the world. Bonhoeffer saw that that was inherently evil. He said, you know, that is a form of idolatry. People are worshiping Adolf Hitler, and he spoke out against him. And as a result, as you can well imagine, he was arrested. He was always released. In fact, one time, he joined a, a, a group, and they carried out a plot called Valkyrie. That there was a movie made about the, this a few years ago that Tom Cruise starred in. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was involved in that assassination plot against Adolf Hitler. The only reason he was not mentioned in the movie is because his family did not give permission. But he was heavily involved in that. And you might say, you know, I don't, I don't know that I approve of a man of God trying to assassinate somebody. But Bonhoeffer's... Uh, rationale was this. He said, it is better to do evil than be evil. If I had just played along and turned a blind eye, I would have been evil incarnate. But I got involved in this evil plot believing that it was the only way that we could save our country. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book about fellowship. And he describes fellowship as doing life together. Now, that's the best definition I have ever heard. We are just together. We're one mind, one heart, one body, one voice. Everything we do, we do as a body. I went to a couple of AA meetings with a family member years ago, and I'll never forget when you walked in, everybody there just hugged on you and kissed on you. I mean, here I, I was just a, a little kid accompanying a family member. But as the, as the time began, every one of them stood up and said, My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. My name is Mary, I'm an alcoholic. I thought, you know, we ought to do some of that at church sometime. Uh, I just need to stand up before you and say, My name is Greg Bowers, and I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. My righteousness is as filthy rags. There is nothing good about me at all. The only thing good about me is the blood of Jesus Christ that has taken my black sins and made me white as snow. We ought to do that more than we do. Don't come and just give off the impression that everything is hunky-dory. Yeah, I know it's not. This is not a place to try to impress people. This is a place where we share and we let our needs be, be known, knowing that people will, will be sensitive to those needs. So the fact that Jesus is available enables us to have fellowship with Almighty God. No other religion promises that. Do you know of any religion anywhere that says, hey, you come be a part of us, you will have intimacy with God Almighty. Did you know that the Koran, you know, the, the holy book of Islam, only has one reference to Allah being close to his people? There's one small out-of-the-way verse that says Allah will draw close to his people to slash the throat of the infidel. That's the only reference to Allah being close. They know intimacy. These people live in holy terror of Allah. They live in holy terror of Buddha and all of these other false gods who've lived and died and are now in hell, presumably. But we have intimacy with Almighty God. And the end result, verse 4, these things right we unto you that your joy may be full. Don't you want to be joyful? You don't want to walk around looking like a, 
you know, professional dill pickle taster. You want to walk around with a smile and a radiant glow, uh, demonstrating a joy that only Jesus Christ can give. It, you know, as I wrap up, it, it seems to me that there are three ways that you can view your life. I, I, I love to just watch people. I could go to the mall and sit in a chair and just watch people all day long. You know, I, I've been around, uh, and you know, usually when I maybe, you know, meet somebody and, and I think uh, perhaps he doesn't really want to know I'm a preacher, I usually say, well, I just work with people, <laughs> which is the truth. But I, I love to watch people. See, like there are three prevailing attitudes. There are some people who believe that life is a battle. I mean, every day they get up and they're mad at the world. You know, who can I lash out at today? Who can I seek revenge against today? All these people have hurt me and I'm angry and I'm going to do battle with them. And every single day I'm just going to gear up. Now, you know, obviously we do battle with our adversary, the devil, but the world, uh, you know, they, the world has already been defeated and judged and one day will be punished because of the way it's rejected Jesus Christ. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. There are people who view life as a battle. Other people view life as a burden. You know, every day, oh, I'm so worn out. I remember my grandmother saying, oh, I hope I'm sick. I'd hate to be well and feel this bad. <laughs> it was her standard answer for the last 20 years of her life. You know, people just kind of live like life is a burden. And they're always just downcast, and there's a black cloud that follows them everywhere they go. But then finally, there are people who view life as a blessing, a gift from God, an opportunity to do things that, that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do. Some of us who have living spouses and living parents, we have the opportunity tonight to do something that you would give your right arm to do. There are some of you who would say, man, I'd give, I'd give everything I have to have five more minutes with my spouse who's gone on to be with the Lord. We have that opportunity. It is a blessing afforded to us. And as we go forward, I want you to see life as a blessing. You know, life is joyful. It's exciting. It is worth living. You know, I know that, uh, you know, our, our citizenship is in heaven. But, you know, I plan on being on this earth for at least, you know, 40, 50 more years. And I figure I'm going to make the most of every day that God gives me. I'm not going to be so heavenly minded that I'm of no earthly benefit at all. I'm just going to view every day as a blessing from God. And I hope that you will join me in that commitment as we serve and worship our eternal Christ, our incarnate Christ, and our available Christ. Let's pray we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, you know, we thank you for your word. We thank you for describing our Savior in such a beautiful terms. Anyone can understand this, Lord. It's not to trigonometry. It's something that even a child can understand. And I pray that you would take my feeble efforts and again ma magnify them and multiply them. And I pray that each of us would have serious business with you, either tonight or tomorrow or in the days to come, and help us to reaffirm our commitment to you and our desire to live a godly life, demonstrating the light of the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere where we go. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good night.